This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Welcome this morning to our service. I want you to realize that in about a few days we will see the fall season coming in. As you can see, the altar has been decorated that way for a few weeks. I look forward to the temperature being a little bit lower consistently and so that we can enjoy this fall time that we, we are going into. Now we'll have our laughter the best mess. <laughs> I don't think I would want that food after the song there. <laughs> now we're going to have our nice Good morning, all the state family. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I know you, but I have a dog who probably would live and wait for the night <laughs> for the scout to finish. So, uh, uh, patience yes. and wisdom. Definitely qualities we want to cultivate. It is indeed a beautiful day, a beautiful, almost fall day, and it is great to be in uh, church. And um, I always feel like special when I come into to church, but uh, having Christina and the music here, it really just gives an extra flourish, and it doesn't have to be in, in church. So, um, of course, we reached that time, the time in our service where uh, we were sharing any announcements. So, I want to open the floor and see with you, Penny. Yes, Kevin.
We have the wonderful Gary. <laughs> we have the awesome sauce, Dick. <laughs> Lady Jo Best Strong. And of course, I must give recognition to her man, Eric. We're gonna sing, you know anything about old timers? You know anything about old timers? Not old, but you can bring it down. Old timers. Well, we're gonna sing it, but I need you to help. So do this, please. Everybody. Keep that beat. Come on now. Everybody. by abolishing in his flesh the law 
with his commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by the one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Almighty God, this morning we want to know not peace as the world shares it, but we want to know divine peace. We want to know peace and unity as only you truly can share it with us. Help us break down laws that are barriers to peace, to unity, to working together in harmony with one another. Help us to remember that without your peace, there is chaos, there is disorder, there are so many things going on that are not right with you. But through your peace, we can continue to live as you designed for us to live originally as one with each other and one with you. We thank you and we ask you to grant this peace and help us to share it everywhere we go. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This morning, I want us to consider this thought. Unity through the blood of Christ. Unity through the blood of Christ. Now I know this isn't first Sunday, but there is never a wrong time to discuss unity. And not just unity as we see it, but unity as God sees it. Unity through the blood of Christ. There's a story that I want to share with you of this old pioneer. And he was settling, and he had settled in the, in the Wild West in the 1800s. And he had a beautiful ranch, and he and his, and his family were very happy. All the people who had settled land around him, they were good, they were friendly people. They never had any trouble with their neighbors because they were all friends, and they got along wonderfully. One day, the old settler was sitting on his porch when a wagon pulled up. It turns out the man in the wagon was from back east and was looking to stake a claim. So he asked the settler, what kind of neighbors do you have? He was kind of surprised when the old man answered his question with a question of his own. He asked, well, what kind of neighbors did you have back east? And the easterner told him they were cranky, they were unfriendly, they were contagious. And the settler looked back up at him and said, well, I'm afraid that's the same kind of uh, neighbors that you'll find here. So the man left to stake his claim somewhere else. A few days later, another wagon pulled up asking the same question. And the settler answered with his same question. This time, the travelers answered that their neighbors were the most kind and loving neighbors in the world. And the settler told them, you'll find the same kind of neighbors here. Now, why did he give the two travelers this same answer? Because the settler was a wise man. He knew that unity with others usually starts with ourselves. When our heart is right, it is a whole lot easier to be right with others. If these settlers fought and argued with their neighbors back east, they would probably do the same thing out west. But if their neighbors were loving and kind, it probably meant that they were treated with loving kindness themselves. Unity is a choice, but it's not something we can do on our own. If we try to do it on our own, then our attempts 
are, are just full of, full of pride. The fact is, there is only one real kind of unity, and that's the kind that's only provided through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the passage that I just read, Paul starts by reminding the Ephesian Christians who were who they were before they met Christ. When they were without Christ, they had no hope of unity. Because they were Gentiles, they were excluded from the nation of Israel. They were strangers to God's covenant that he made with Israel. They didn't have any hope of salvation, much less unity. They were without God. They were helpless, hopeless, hapless. Now they were in Jesus. They're saved. They're washed in his blood. And let's look at how Paul puts this. He says that they have been brought together. They were once far off, but now they're near. Now they are no longer strangers. They are no longer excluded. They are now unified with each other and with God. My prayer this morning is that each of us will be unified by the blood of Jesus Christ. In order to do this, we're going to look at the two kinds of unity that we have in Jesus. One is unity with each other. Ever since the Tower of Babel back in Genesis 11, people have been looking for unity with each other. Isn't it funny how we can't even get along with our neighbors, but we seem to think that we can unite the world? That's because people are trying to unify around the wrong things. They're trying to unify around programs and projects and buildings and social clubs. They're trying to unite around trees and contracts. But scripture tells us that the only way people can have unity is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. During the time of Paul, no two groups hated each other more than the Jews and the Gentiles. It wasn't like they just disagreed on musical styles and worship or something simple, simple like that. They were ethnically different. They were ethically different. They were racially different. They ate different foods. They came from different cultures. They valued different things. They were offended by different things. They were as different as two groups of people could possibly be, as, the, as far as the East is from the West. But that all changed because of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks down the barriers, the walls that separate people. Looking at verse 15, it tells us he breaks down that wall by abolishing hostility and making peace. Hostility is a, a, a deep, burning hatred. Do you ever wonder why people can be so hostile to each other? Paul tells us in Romans 8, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is hostility, hatred against God. That is humanity's natural state. We were born and shaped in sin, but the blood of Christ reconciles us to one another by abolishing hostility and making peace. Jesus broke down the barriers that separated them. He abolished the hatred between them. And he brought them peace by making them one in the church. Jesus doesn't have nearly as much to overcome in our lives as he did theirs. Or does he? See, we have that same pride issue as the people Paul was writing to. That's why he started by reminding them where they came from. Like those people, we are all in the same boat. We're all sinners, saved by grace. I had a DS that one time, every time he would uh, start a meeting, he would say, good morning, saints, and they would say, good morning. Then he would say, good morning, sinners, and they were like, oh, that's us too, okay. We're both one and the same because we're sinners saved by grace. I'm not any better than any of you, and you're not any better than anyone else that's here. That puts us all on level ground. I've heard it said that the ground is level at the foot of the cross because it's all about Jesus. It's not about us. 
He breaks down the barriers. He abolishes hostility. He makes peace by making us one, by unifying us. But he doesn't unify us so we can just hold hands and sing kumbaya. He unifies us so that we can be reconciled with God. Unity with each other is very, very important. But even more important than that is the second reason. Unity with God. God doesn't reconcile us to each other so we can have great fellowship dinners. He doesn't unify us together so we can have a, a really friendly church. He unifies us to bring glory to God. That's what church is. It is a group of people saved by the grace of God. A group of people who are made one through the blood of Jesus Christ. A body of believers whose carnal hatred for each other has been put to death. Jesus is the one who can boast. Not you, not me. Because he gracious, graciously applied his blood to our lives. It kills any excuse we can come up with to have hatred against each other. Any reason we can find to be hurt or bitter or angry with each other is covered by the blood of Christ. When Paul says in verse 16 that we are reconciled, unified in one body by the cross. Because by the cross, the hostility between us was slain. When we are saved and baptized, as a result of Jesus' sacrifice, our old ways are buried with Christ. When that happens, certain things need to stay in the grave. Our pride, our self-centeredness, our need to get our own way. As Paul puts it, our hostility. Then we are raised with Christ to walk in the newness of life. When that happens, we shouldn't get our shovels out to dig up the old things that were buried. They should stay slain. They should, they need not be, be brought out of that grave. There is certainly a difference between knowing the right thing and doing the right thing. You may have heard this said quite often. When you know better, you do better. Well, I subscribe slightly different. When you know better, you should do better. Does it always mean that we do? And that's why Paul told us in verse 18 that our unity with God is accessed through one spirit, the Holy Spirit. In society, we understand the need for unity. It's something that we all desire. Even people outside of the church want unity. But unity isn't something we get by ourselves. It's not something that we can program into the church. It's not something we can create with better organization or activities. It's something that we get when we seek God through the Holy Spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. First, true unity can only come when we're saved. We can only experience true unity in the church if we are truly a part of the church. That doesn't mean that our name is on the roll. That doesn't mean that we just come every so often and that's all we have to do. That means that we have repented of our sins and trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. If we are still trusting in ourselves, we are not trusting in God. Believe in believe God, believe in Jesus Christ, not our abilities, not our strength, not our ways, but believe in Jesus for our salvation. Yes, sir. Second, true unity can only come when we take our focus off ourselves and place it on Christ. Yes. That can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is to convict our hearts of sin and transform us into disciples. I've said this at a few other churches as I've grown in my own understanding and in my pastoral responsibilities as, as a shepherd of a flock. Now, I'm not scared you for a minute. I don't ever want to take in another member into a church. 
I want to receive disciples into the church. I want to receive people who are saying, I'm not just dying on the road. I want to be a part of this body. I want to be in unity. I want to know what it means to go out into the world and share the gospel message with others. I want to share this peace that I have. Because the world didn't give it to me, and the world cannot take it away. The blood of Christ unifies us with one another. It unifies us by breaking down barriers, by burying our hostility with our old nature, and by giving us access to God by the Holy Spirit. That's why we can come to Jesus' table of communion in unity. Christ set this table, not us, so that we all may have the ability and the responsibility and the privilege to come to dine at his table. See, if we set the table, then we can say, well, you're not able to come yet, or I want you to come twice. But God, through Christ, set the table so that all are welcome. That is why we call it an open table. It's because this is not denied anyone to come to dine at his table. When we depart this sacred space, we should go to the places where we know others need to hear this message. Then they can become a part of the body of Christ in unity with one another. Then they can know that we're not just a place to go on Sunday and be a part of a social club, but we're a part of people who are in the hospital, the spiritual hospital, receiving others into this spiritual hospital for all of our needs to be met. For Christ to wash our sins away. For us to receive the blessing that only we can get from Jesus Christ. When we think about how we came to church and came to Christ ourselves, why wouldn't we want others to receive the blessings that we have received throughout our lives as a part of the body of Christ? as a part of those who know that they know that when they go to the other side of the river Jordan, they will be through eternity with God. That is the unity of all unity because forever, throughout eternity, we won't have to think about peace anymore. We will be a part of peace. Yes. We will be a part of unity. We will live in unity as the hosts in heaven do. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Those aren't just kind and cute words to say. We're supposed to be practicing on earth what already is happening in heaven. Mm -hmm. Unity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us not only receive it, because we are those Gentiles that Paul is talking about. Like I said a few weeks ago, we are in the uttermost parts of the earth, right here in Rome. But let us not just receive them, but share them everywhere that we go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
send us forth and we may share.